Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. I'm here with my guest, Lisa. Hey, Venkat, are you eating a snack today? Yeah, today my snack is not super creative. It's just a muffin. Oh, you're having a muffin. Okay, yep. you did blueberry a much muffin. better blueberry muffin. You're doing a much better job than I did with um, um, I'm eating dried macaroni. Creative. Oh, it's very crunchy. I don't think I can actually eat it during a podcast. Um, yeah, I didn't even know dried macarons were a thing. It's not. I think I'm probably the only human on in the state of Texas that eats it as a snack. Um, All right. So what are we talking about today? Oh, well, so today is our 13th episode. Um, and we're talking, covering the letter M. So we're, after this episode, we'll officially be halfway through the 26 letter alphabet. Um, right, so the halfway point season, you know, what do they call this, uh, season middle show, right? Yeah, well, so uh, there's two middle shows, right? It's this one and N because it's an even number. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. So it's the first half of the middle of the show. Okay, yeah, exactly. right. So what, um, what topics do we have for M? So for M, we have mansions, uh, money, mirrors, monetary policy, which I guess is very similar to money, but maybe not. We'll find out. And then okay. Marx for, as in Karl Marx. Right. So a lot of economics heavy topics, including mansions. <laughs> That's true. This is our, our economic, maybe this will be an economic episode. Um, yeah. Where do you want to start? Do we want to start with uh, mansions? That seems like a good jumping off point. All right, let's start with mansions. Um, all right, I'll go first since I've been uh, tweeting about mansions and I now have a new Twitter account about mansions called Basic Mansion. So um, it kind of started as a, as a joke. <clears throat> I made a little sketch one day on my iPad of a mansion because uh, I have this uh, strong feeling I'll never actually have a mansion in real life. So I figured I should have at least a 2D cartoon mansion. Uh, and mansions are kind of interesting, right? Uh, and I think I started thinking about them uh, after watching um, Ricky Gervais's The Invention of Lying, which is uh, among his uh, really interesting movies. And so the premise of that movie is that it's a world where nobody lies, nobody knows how to lie. And the concept of lying does not exist. And uh, I think he gets hit by lightning or something. And somehow he comes up with the concept of lying and uh, realizing that he can just make stuff up. Oh, and for context, in this uh, world without lying, there are no, there's no fiction or movies or anything. So instead of uh, fictional TV, everybody like makes historical documentaries. And he's stuck with a very boring century, I think. Like, 13th century or whatever, it's very boring. So his documentaries are boring or are not popular. So he's not a popular TV guy. And he decides, hey, I can just make up stories and uh, make them interesting that way. And he keeps making up lies and eventually he makes up a religion. And the uh, I'm giving away the punchline here, but the premise of his religion is everybody gets a mansion in the art afterlife. So that's where I got the concept. Everybody gets a mansion. And then I started making jokes about it. Uh, I think at some point I was calling my Twitter account Universal Basic Mansion. So the, the idea there is a mansion is like one of those um, material things where you cannot pretend it's a basic necessity. It's like minimum viable luxury. Uh, at some, if you have a mansion, you cannot pretend that it's anything other than like extreme material well-being, right? Like even in the Middle Ages, when uh, everybody was suffering from the Black Death and people were dying of like wars and knights running to, you know, killing them and stuff, the rich people had mansions and uh, the entire economy, this whole term for mansion-based economy, manorial economy is an economy built around estates, around mansions, right? Uh, so yeah, mansions are sort of a I had a placeholder concept for me representing a lot of things, both aspirational things as in I kind of like worlds dominated by mansions and uh, sort of topics of interest as in I like thinking about mansion economics. What would be an aspect of mansion economics that you find interesting? 
I like that mansions are sort of a very local consensus reality. Like if you think about the concept of a nation state, a nation state is a really large consensus reality. Like the United States is 330 million people who all believe in this particular social fiction, right? And if you look at, yeah, so I'm reading, I think I mentioned this before, Barbara Tuckman's book on the 14th century uh, when the Black Death was uh, doing the rounds. And there you can kind of tell that even though entities like France and England existed, the true sort of uh, reality distortion fields were the manorial estates of the rich nobles. So the book, for example, is just as a sort of um, a storytelling device, it's built around um, the life story of a particular uh, French nobleman. And a lot of the book weaves through the story of his estate and the rise and fall of its fortunes through you know, the ages. And so it becomes sort of a unit of social analysis and reality. And it's like, you just like you know today i guess today's sort of conceptual mansions would be uh big tech companies like apple apple has its internal reality distortion field during steve jobs times so back then those would be like manorial estates you look at downton abbey have you watched downton abbey i have it no okay so downton abbey is this completely whitewashed uh, romanticized view of um, early 20th century english um, you know, rich countryside life. So it's about the estate, which is Downton Abbey, which is this huge mansion in a big estate. And of course, it's like almost bankrupt. And the uh, Earl of um, Grantham, I guess, is the nobleman who owns it. Uh, he marries a rich American heiress to get the money to kind of rescue the thing. So that was a trope in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, so Downton Abbey is... Uh, a total reality distortion field. Like that's not how manorial estates were run back then. Like the condition of the servants and you know, practically not serfs, but people working the land wasn't as great as portrayed on the show. But anyway, so mansions as reality distortion fields and therefore the basis for both economies and sort of political narratives and everything else. Yeah, I think that's an interesting, um aspects that you can mention because my question about when you mention a mansion and what I, so when I think of mansions the first thing that comes to mind is the big mansions that are fairly um I would say ubiquitous in Texas particularly in like the suburbs or depends on kind of what part of the city you get to but like richer parts of the city is like I think this is still fairly true like the idea of making it in Texas is some form of a used to be at least like certain form of suburban making it is a McMansion out on like a certain like you know you have a little bit a little bit of land um, enough to maybe get a, a tractor that you sit on or like the driving lawnmowers um, and then you know big McMansion um, which I think are also it's also an aesthetic judgment I think of the particular dwelling. Um, but it's interesting there, right? Because you're doing two things and calling it a McMansion. First, you're sort of uh, pointing to it being of a lower economic class than a real mansion. Like I imagine the truly wealthy Texas people, they have like actual ranches out in the countryside where like you can't even see the main house from the road or whatever, with like cattle and stuff. That's a real mansion. Like even though they would call it a ranch house or something in Texas, a McMansion is in a suburb where you can literally see the neighboring mansion from yours. That's not really a mansion. So it's kind of like an ersatz premium mediocre mansion. But the other aspect of that is the aesthetic judgment is important. It kind of is a complaint against the fact that the owner or builder of a McMansion kind of has like enough economic and political power and control over how they build and architect the mansion that they can be as tasteless as they want. So you can be any kind of like precious snowflake artist in the uh, urban district saying, oh, it's ugly or whatever, it's spoiling the landscape, but you can't do anything about it. The mansion owner can make it as ugly or as beautiful or as tasteful or as tasteless as they want. And I think that by the way, is, another aspect of the reality distortion field. The fact that you have control to sort of set the aesthetics any way you like, that's I think a defining feature of a mansion. So by that criterion, I think mansions are real mansions. The fact that you can choose to make them tasteless. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> uh, 
So there's a, there's another aspect of when I think of mansions, like other than McMansions, and even McMansions is like I think you kind of touched on this when you were talking about how you think of mansions economy being kind of this nation state sort of thing. Is that every maybe I'm thinking about it a lot because I don't I own a house, but it's not very big. It's like a townhouse. Um, and one thing I've been thinking about a lot is just like the maintenance of it, like vacuuming and getting the trees trimmed and like there's some plumbing problems that I need to get taken care of so like any any physical property requires like maintenance um and like so mansions even like mansions like tend to have like domestic staff that help out most people in Texas even even non-McMansion owners will have like yard guys that's like super common and having a maid that comes and does stuff is also very common um trying to think if there's other like I don't know I'm trying to like you know I'm gonna have like a tree guy who like comes and cuts my trees and then I've got a just because of the way my house is built I can't clean the gutters myself so I have to have a gutter guy who comes and like gets the leaves out of the gutter um I was looking at finding like a window washing guy but that's like a little bit like kind of fancy like I don't need the window washing guy um I just kind of want him and there's like yeah anyways um, so you're yeah, like really Lady Lisa of the manor, huh? I mean, <laughs> home economics, you know, it's like a whole, like, which I don't feel like home ec in, like, the schooling sense ever necessarily meant, like, all this management of your property. It meant more, like, cooking economy and cleaning and, like, but maybe yeah, not. That, maybe that's changed fun. a lot. Uh, lately, uh, but but your your townhouse is it detached on its own plot of land or is it one of those attached things? It's attached. Oh, okay. I feel a lot like I live in a brownstone. Um, yeah. Okay. It's very. I think a brownstone's a good analogy. It's probably about a similar size to like a Brooklyn brown home. Uh, so there's there's kind of like an interesting. Again, we are running into definitional boundaries here. So sharing a wall. So it's kind of like a space shared mansion, right? Same thing. All your staff they don't work for you exclusively. Like a traditional noble estate in medieval Europe, you would literally have tenants on the land whose entire economic life would revolve around you, right? Whereas here, you kind of time-shared your serfs. Your serfs are yeah. like 10% yours, right? <laughs> Not how many clients they serve. And then within, um, I mean, you could even say within like our townhome, so there's like six townhomes kind of in a little cul-de-sac thing. And so when we got the trees, I organized getting our trees cut last week, but... I coordinated and we all like, you know, all, all of the, all of the little mini mansion, little, little, little homes, like time shared the surface collectively as a group to get it done. So yes. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. Maybe there's like a, a, I don't know, very deep archaic drive humans have to kind of have their own little territorial plot of land with no shared boundaries, either social or material or temporal or whatever. Right. Like, um, mm it I mean, makes you think yeah yeah so like when I was telling some friends that I was you know buying a townhouse in Texas and moving back to Texas um a couple of them I guess one in particular pushed back when they found out I was gonna have so my townhouse shares a wall with the neighboring townhouse much like you know mm -hmm. like brownstone it's only one wall though um and I, I run into a bunch of people when they find out find out that particular aspect of my house that are just like oh no I don't know why you would want that like I want like a house like they're very much no no I need like a house that like no walls touching anyone like how can you settle for a house that doesn't have like at least you know like zero separation from your neighbors that's the whole thing about getting a house or a mansion right is this ability <laughs> to be like completely isolated from your neighbors that doesn't sound as much fun to me um I don't know. I really it's um, like okay. even sharing a wall, that's just the sort of most extreme form of like entering into non-mansionhood. So I think you could actually say you're a half mansion based on the fact that you have one shared wall with a neighbor, right? And if it were yeah. one of those units that's, I've seen like uh, uh, non-detached townhouses that are four to a, a units so or two upper and two lower. So then you'd be sharing with two. So that would make you a quarter mansion or something. Uh, but if you look at actual mansions in feudal Europe or other parts of the world, the, they don't even share a land boundary because the way these things work, you've got the mansion and the mansion's own estate. And around it, you've got a bunch of tenant villages and pastures and stuff that are sort of um, 
uh, owned or operated by like freehold tenant farmers or something. So before you get, uh, once you exit your manor boundary and get to the next manor's boundary, there's actually a bunch of villages and maybe forests and hunting grounds and wildernesses in between. So that's like true mansion state. And uh, I think um, we are very far from those kinds of true mansions for most of us today. It's true, yeah. Actually, like, okay, so to kind of, it's interesting you bring that up. I don't know if this is an interesting side, side way, but there were, there's a bunch of mansions out in Long Island, which is close to New York City. So a lot of the titans and magnates who had offices and also residences in Manhattan had mansions out on Long Island. Um, and they were all, they all had like woods attached to them. So they like had grounds, you know, there's a mansion in the grounds. And when Robert Moses was building the Long Island Expressway, um, he, and this is actually Robert Caro pointed out as to one of the first times that Robert Moses, or like the first time that Robert Moses compromised on his ideals in order to get his project done, is that instead of attempting, so there, there was a version of the, um, of the Long Island Expressway that was nice and straight and cut through a lot of these woods that didn't have houses on them, but were like private grounds of very wealthy, wealthy, very wealthy Republicans in mm -hmm. New York City. Um, and he wasn't able to get the political capital, so to speak, to cut through their land. So instead, he ended up cutting through a bunch of small farms that were just to the south of these large estates. Um, and so Robert Carroll has this like really heartbreaking story about a small family farm that's trying to make it. And then their land got cut in half. And the um, added time it took them to get between the two pieces to, in order to work it um, was such a huge burden. I mean, if you have to spend an extra half hour, 40 minutes going to get even to the other part of the field to keep working it, um, it basically destroyed, you know, this one small farm. And that was because he, it was easier politically to cut through 500 small family farms than one wooded ground that belonged to a mansion. Um, this is, this example reminds me of uh, the California case uh, in Monterey against Vinod Khosla. Have you been following that? Is this with the, are you referring to the one about the beach? Yes. So he's got, he's this uh, rich VC guy who's got this uh, huge plot of land by the ocean. And California has, I think, public beach access laws. And the only road to this beach is through his land. And he's basically been fighting it all the way to the Supreme Court. So it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, it's not just that you don't want shared boundaries with neighbors, you want gaps and buffers with the next neighbor, but you don't even want any right of way or right of passage uh, kind of um, rights for anybody else. So it truly is as much autonomy as you can uh, get. So that's kind of fascinating that there's that whole politics around mansion rights. And I think if yeah. you look at the future of mansions, like uh, remember mansions started going out of style uh, around the time air travel was invented, right? So nobody ever talked about, so they talked about mineral rights. There have been like manorial estates with like mines and stuff on property, not just farmland, but not air rights, right? But you can imagine a sufficiently large mansion in a modern era if we had, if we went back to kind of like a medieval type uh, economic organization, you can imagine larger estates demanding um, air rights, right? Uh, so that would include like anti-aircraft guns and <laughs> missiles to shoot down drones. So all sorts of things could happen. So <laughs> that would be a fun future. Would it, would it <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of like rooting for a slightly a return to a slightly enlightened version of uh, manorial e economics because it's a it's a way to go from like these huge centralized big state governments to something in between that and uh, a libertarian um, utopia kind of thing. And so you're like a little bit of feudalism, strong manhold, stronghold, and strongholdism. Yeah, a little bit, because uh, I have a feeling that, uh, okay, so there's a long historical arc we are talking about. Like, if you look at, say, uh, let's just stick to the Western Europe example, because Asia was different. But in Western Europe, Rome was a very advanced urban economy. So the Romans built large cities, and wherever they sort of uh, conquered other territories, they built like Roman style cities. So you can find Roman style cities in like North Africa and England everywhere, right? And the Middle Ages was about retreating from that urbanized civilizational pattern to a much more rural, 
uh, slightly decentralized feudal pattern. And um, the Magna Carta was about the barons sort of taking power away from the emperor, right? And you see this, especially middle to late middle ages. So roughly 1000 to about 1480, the entire economy is built around these feudal estates and fairly weak imperial power. And after 1400, after the Black Death, professional armies, all those things, uh, imperial power began consolidating. And that's when like big empires started growing up, colonial empires started growing. But for that period when feudal empire, feudal arrangements were the norm, you kind of had some very interesting advantages there. It's like, it's got a lot of features. Like for example, uh, you had, um, a version of what we would today call, uh, what do they call them? N not charter cities. I, I guess charter cities, the idea that if you don't like a city, you can just pick up and go to some other city. So imagine a city state economy where people are not bound to the land. It's not like your serfs or feudal uh, people on the land. If you don't like a particular small territory, you can pack up and leave. So you can do that within large countries now, but increasingly in sort of, for example, China, you cannot do that. So in China, like the, central government controls movement between provinces and cities, right? Um, so this is taking that logic to an extreme where, so you don't want the Middle Ages pattern where there was like literal serfdom, especially in Eastern Europe where serfs were bound to the land. But you do want a pattern where there's basically more choices. Like just like today we can move between states and get, get a little bit of variety. Like you don't like California, you can move to Texas, right? You get a few different things like uh, uh, lower, like lower state taxes, but you, then you give up certain other things and so forth. So there's limited choice. And I think if you ended up with a mix of city state and feudal arrangements and no really large countries, you would have a lot more choices. So like all the people who love Peter Thiel can go live on Peter Thiel's New Zealand estate and then they can see how much they like being ruled by Peter Thiel. Okay, now I'm off on a Peter Thiel rant. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there's interesting things to explore in those futures. I mean, I think you could make the argument that, well, hmm. I think this has been like a tension within the United States since its founding, right? Is the level of control of any given organization um, in the government. Maybe in Texas, we definitely seem to relitigate it constantly, um, even between the city and state level, constantly. It's constantly being relitigated. Relit Every time like a city doesn't do something, does something that some power that be doesn't like, they try and get the state to make a decision on it. Um, and then, yeah, and then Texas as a state is constantly, especially during the Obama era, constantly questioning how much we had to follow any rules that the federal government said that we had to do. So there's definitely like, um, I don't know, it's definitely like an ongoing conversation that Texans seem to have at like varying so it's, levels. It's slightly um, different from what we're talking about here, right? Because the federal versus um, state kind of like debate in the US, it's still within the framework of uh, basically egalitarian democratic um, rights pattern of um, governance, right? Whereas feudalism within the manorial estate, the owner of the feudal territory kind of has autocratic um, privileges. And uh, if you wanted to embed that kind of like um, autocratic fiefdom idea within a democratic world, the only way you could do that is to say, all right, if you want, you can run this ranch or commune or whatever it is like a benevolent dictator. Uh, but if you want to do it within a democracy, then people can't be held there. If they want to voluntarily live on your estate and work with or for you, great. But if they want to leave, they can leave. And so that's, so that's one way I would depart from the 13th century version of this. Um, but the reason I like feudalism is it's a test of, I think, the limit of one dictatorial person's ability to organize social reality, right? Uh, whereas if you look at a true dictator in sort of a modern 20th century sense, they're backed by a huge military and with great force, they can rule like entire huge countries like uh, Soviet Union with Stalin or, um, you know, German dictatorships and things like that. Whereas feudalism, it's slightly different. You, you have, it's like, it's like trying to have your monarchy cake and 
eating it too, where you have the benefits of both. What can you have the benefits of like a democratic way of life, but with the benefit of seeing what one person organizing a very small piece of, uh, you know, geography can do. And um, can you have that kind of reality? And I think there's, there's interesting potential there. Like, um, I don't know. I think it's an interesting kind of future to explore. And I think that's effectively what we're doing, by the way, with uh, tech companies, because uh, intellectual capital now is more important than um, land capital. So if you are the founder of a company like Google or Facebook or Apple, you've created like a territory, a feudal territory that's way more valuable than an equivalent piece of land. And there's people who opt in and work there and like the lifestyle that's secured for them by, well, like if you work, have you been inside the Google Plex or Facebook campus or something? They are like little manorial estates. Yeah, I've been in, I think I've been on a Google satellite. I don't think I've ever been to the Google Plex, but I've definitely been to a satellite office down in the Valley. Oh, it's totally yeah. worth visiting because the it's uncanny how much it resembles like our idea of medieval feudal life. It's like, this is a feudal barony. <laughs> Like, and it's voluntary. That's the key part. I want to keep emphasizing that because this is not serfdom. It's not people held to land against their will. It's people voluntarily signing up to say, hey, I'll be in the Google Plex and take your money and let you run my life, including my laundry. So it's, it's a feudal life. So I think something that I'm interested in, so like, I feel like there is like an interesting, you can run kind of an interesting analog, at least in the geographic sense of like, there's like within larger cities. So like within larger cities, there's often this like fight for local control and that like so my, my parents live in a um, small community in Houston that is incorporated as its own tiny little city. Like not, it's not Houston, it's like something else. Um, and they have their own police force. They have their own like trash stuff. like. They as a, and it's a small community, and so they, as like a very small neighborhood, basically run their own affairs. Um, and it's like these are very common in Texas. There's a bunch, semi famous one in Dallas called the Highland Park, which is actually where um, who's a famous guy for Doom stuff. He does a lot of uh, graphics programming. I'm like Carmack, John Carmack. Oh, yeah, John Carmack. Yeah, oh, he lives there. Okay. Yeah, which is a um, enclave in Dallas that's beautiful. I used to go on runs there when I lived in Dallas for summer. Um, but it's like, it's the same thing. It's like a city with its own police force and its own rules and they don't pay city taxes, which is a big reason a lot of these places do it. And they, you know, they have their own school system, which is separate from the cities, like Dallas city. Um, and it's kind of a way that they avoid hang into a larger system that won't benefit them as much because they're able to, you know, like run their own Dominated. rules if they want. Um, as a, also, Disney World had one that they tried to create. They were going to create their own. Walt Disney was going to create his own, like, city, like, feudal. I don't know if you call it a feudal area. Um, and it got incorporated yeah. and they got some special laws passed that, like, they wouldn't actually have to pay. There's something interesting with, like, Florida where they, like, got some special exemption. I want to say on property taxes, but I could be wrong about that. Um, oh, yeah. I think if you sort of loosen the definition of a manorial estate sufficiently okay. to include, like, uh, large corporations or, like, special economic zones where, like, uh, individuals yeah. or uh, corporations can have, like, special sort of regulations, you, you'll actually find that there's a lot more feudalism already sort of de facto feudalism in uh, even the United States today than uh, people might otherwise suspect. Uh, and um, yeah. I, I keep trying to think of like defining the idea of a mansion in sort of the most interestingly abstract form possible. And this might be a good segue to the you know monetary policy type stuff you want to talk about. Uh, but think about um, like open source uh, projects. Like I've been reading a lot about, uh, what's his name? Uh, Guido von Rossum, the inventor of Python. And he was the first one, I think, to be given the title of benevolent di dictator for life. And many open source projects are in fact run that way. Now, you happen to be part of one that's not run that way because Bitcoin has structurally, it sort of has a dictator resistance in certain clean senses, but Ethereum, for example, does not. Um, uh, but yeah, lots of open source projects are, I would say, software manners that are run by 
hopefully benevolent dictators, right? Yeah, and it's actually, I think this, like, it's, I think, I think you made an interesting, this is, I think offensive software will prove to be an interesting analogy, especially in uh, that tenant that you were talking about in terms of the ability to like branch off and like, so if you like don't like what's going on, you can branch off and do your own thing. Um, mm -hmm. In software, there's a very, it's a fork, right? Which yeah, exactly. forks mean one thing in crypto currencies um, and then kind of another in like the source code sense. So like yep. there's a couple different types of forks you can talk about in software. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a really good analogy. Um, I didn't know that Guido Van Rossen was made, did, but, but Ben Elevit, dictator of life of the Python spec process, right? So like he like yeah. runs and maintains. He was the first one for whom the, I think it started as a joke in one of the sort of well, PEPs. It started as he's called, I think, first interim benevolent dictator for life. And it, the joke turned into reality. But eventually the reason this is famous is in 2016, I think he basically quit. He said, I'm no longer benevolent dictator. Here's the email. You guys do what you want, right? Yeah. And uh, by the way, the fork analogy, I think, has a parallel in um, uh, the geographic world. Now, if, if you take like a country-sized piece of territory and completely carve it up into feudal territories, then there's nowhere to fork to because if you exit one manner, because it's a zero-sum game, you have to go end up as a tenant on some other manner, right? So there's nowhere to fork to. But in the 13th century mm -hmm. or so, as feudal economics started to struggle, more and more free cities began uh, sort of uh, emerging. So the bourgeoisie, they're sort of, um, they kind of bought their freedom from the nobility. So there's a third estate versus a second estate thing. So merchant classes who were becoming traders in the newly sort of emerging free cities, um, eventually they kind of created all these first free cities. And even in the sort of tenant villages of um, manorial estates, as these knights and nobles went off on crusades and basically ran up huge debts, they kind of had to find ways to like uh, recover the debts. And what they did was they basically allowed their tenant farmers to buy their own freedom. So a lot of these villages around the manorial estates, they paid off the nobles to create their own quote unquote fork cities and villages. And a lot of Western Europe, that's in fact the true birth of modern democracy. It's not Greece or some other fictitious ancient history. It's, it was a very feudal, every, the feudal nobility had carved up all the territory, but then they got into financial trouble and basically sold freedom to whoever could buy it. And therefore, it is emerged as forks. I'm laughing <laughs> because, so what I'm laughing about is that is these dudes who basically owned their own manor and had everything that they could ever possibly want, and then they ran off to war and got into fights, and it was so costly. Getting into fights was so expensive that democracy got invented, is basically what I'm hearing. <laughs> exactly. Um, which I feel like there's definitely modern analogies to us running off to war and getting into debt so that who knows what gets invented. Um, also, like, oh, this is oh, this is a great segue into monetary policy. Holy <laughs> cow. Um, so, like, one of my favorite... There was something else I wanted to bring up, but I'm totally forgetting. It's fine. We're going onward now. We're in we're in monetary policy land. Um, right. The so one of my absolute favorite. Um, so I think there's like there's like a body of literature that's about like financial ruin, and it's like stories and like Michael Lewis has a great collection called Panic. That's like he goes back and looks at like I want to say five or six modern financial crashes and just puts together a whole bunch of like first um first-hand documents like before and after mm -hmm. the crash like from newspapers and stuff that sort of like goes through sort of what happened and why and what people were saying about the crash before and after um there's another really great um amazing work by Charles Mackey who is a journalist in the I want to say 1800s who went his his book is um extraordinary delusions and the pop oh, yeah, madness yeah. of crowds or something. Yep. Um, but the first 300 pages, all I've read, um, someone made this great little book that's just the first three and they're all economic because the book as a whole covers all kinds of popular crazy ass stuff that happens. Like the witch, um, I someone say the Salem witch trials, he talks about them and just any sort of mania that like everyone in society like gets carried up in. But the first three stories um, are the French 
currency uh, catastrophe, I want to say in the 1800s, again, war debts, trying to pay off some war debts. Was this the John Law thing, Mississippi yes. Company and stuff? Okay, yeah. Louisiana, I think they called it like the Louisiana scandal or the, yep. um, yeah, okay, so we'll get, well, yeah, so there's, that one's the first one. I want to come back to talking to that one because it's like my favorite. Um, and then there's this, the, so the three that he covers in the first hundred pages are the Louisiana scandal in France with this John character, John Law, I guess. Yeah, John Law, um, yeah. And then the second one is the South Sea Bubble, which is a very mm -hmm. similar issue, but that happens in the UK. And it's not necessarily related to war stuff, I don't think. It might yeah. be, though, who knows. And then that the was third genuine one, uncertainty, I think. The South Sea Bubble was like, it was kind of legit. It was not like the, was the third one going to be the tulip one? That's the famous tulip one. Tulip mania, yeah, yeah, in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. They're all, so they're all really different. Um, I think the, the thing about the first two that's in common is that both of them involve some amount of speculation on a, um, so, oh, so, so this is like, I love, sorry, I love the context for both of these. Um, both of them, I think, are happening roughly around or after the time that Spain went to the Americas and made this huge discovery of gold and is bringing back carton, like, you know, like huge freaking, uh, what are they called? The big ships, cargo ships of mm -hmm. um, frigates are coming back. Spanish galleons, sorry. Galleons, these, like, yeah. these like trains of Spanish galleons coming back from the Americas laden with gold and silver and Spain is like, fabulously wealthy and so there's France and there's England and both of them also have these ideas that they're going to go exploring and make a lot of money so they form charters um, to explore different territories so the South Sea one is named for the company that got chartered the South Sea Charter Company mm -hmm. um, that was going to go and so you could buy shares in the company and then the money that you put in as the shares of the company would pay out at some future point when they also discovered um gold mines that would they would bring back in like whatever mm -hmm. the english like charter ships were not you know not spanish galleons but the english like flipper mm -hmm. ships or something um so that was like so the south sea the south sea bubble was basically people bidding on the returns from this like company and then there's this whole anyway so that's the south sea thing and then louisiana was like um the french government put together I think like a similar thing that they were going to go explore Louisiana territory and make lots of money um, but the problem was that um, selling shares in this venture was worth a lot was like very profitable to the French government the French government was having a lot of problems paying off the debts from I believe a then deceased king so I'm not going to get the names right but there was a king who spent a lot of money maybe some of it on wars basically ruined the French like um, whatever the purse of the state, whatever all the money that the state had got spent, so they needed it. So they started doing various things um, to try and fix it. Like they would ask everyone to bring their, cause back then currency was like um, silver and gold. So they'd ask everyone to bring all their like French liras in and then they'd give you back the same number of liras, but all like slightly less weight. So they would like- So basic currency skinning. debasement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, but it was like actual physical currency debasement. You bring your money in, they take off a little bit and give you the same number of coins back. And it's like, look, magic, we just made more money out of the silver. Um, they were they're already doing that. And then John, this John Law character comes and shows up and is like, hang on, I can fix this for you. We're going to make a company. I'm going to like, so basically he's like, I'm going to make paper money. Um, the paper money isn't going to be based on like debt or anything. It's going to be based on this Louisiana venture. So we're going to sell stock in the venture and that's how we're going to raise money. Uh, and so at the time, I believe there was like a regent running France because the king had died mm -hmm. and the kid who was going to be king next was like a child. So there was like this regent. And so John became good friends with this regent. John was like some like dis dissolute, disreputable gambler guy who would like run away from the UK for some reason. I think he got caught up in some like scandal in the UK and had come to France and made friends with like the people there as like a gambler. Um, so he sets up this like company and it's doing really well in the French parliament, like lots of people own lots of shares. Um, and so the way that they like, every time they need more money, they just print more shares <laughs> and sell them. 
to the population. And so there's this huge run up in the value of these shares and people like these little marketplaces pop up. Um, they turn some like palace pleasure ground into like a open air stock market where people can run around and trade their paper shares. Um, and some people do really well, like they sell them before the crash, right? So they sell them before it comes out that they're not worth anything. Um, and this is my favorite part, I think, is like, how do you, how did they escape? They like bought gold and silver, like plate, as they call it, which I'm assuming is like dishes that might be something else. Yeah, they I would, think like, it's sell dishes, their yeah. stock, buy the stuff, put it on a wagon, take the wagon to Amsterdam. Because at some point, the government realized that they were totally fucked. And this whole thing starts collapsing. And so the government makes it such that no one is allowed to own above X amount of gold and silver. And they like stop anyone trying to cross the borders. And uh, I think it's like they have this period where like neighbors are telling on each other because if you have too much gold and silver, like they can send, you know, point the police at you and they'll come and take stuff. So there's like a lot of jealous neighbors that like start sending the like gold and silver police on their like friends and relatives or like, you know, the Joneses across the street with their nice mansion, like go see what their stuff <laughs> is. Um, so the whole thing like super implodes. And so Charles Mackey like basically tells this whole story. Um, but I think it's like really interesting. So there's two things about that that I find interesting. Like, so you know how Tesla keeps printing stock? Um, Every time Tesla runs into monetary trouble, I feel like they did this when their stock price was at like $800 a few months ago. All of a sudden they had, we're raising a billion dollars in new stock and they just like hand stock out. Um, it's also what, what made Enron implode. Enron um, had a huge amount of debt and they kept borrowing more money from these like investment banks they figured out a way to like borrow money from banks and the way that they would back it with like when you when you take out a loan you need some like collateral behind it that like backs up if the loan goes south and so a lot of the contracts that they had with banks for lines of credit and stuff that they had done um were based on like the stock like a certain amount of stock and the share price so as long as they kept their share price above a certain thing, like all of their stuff was fine. But as soon as the share price fell between a certain, below a certain amount, all of this, I think you'd have to like put up more collateral. It's a lot like- um, It's like a margin call except with investment banking, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, or like options or something. Like there's some sort of like stock option that when the price of the thing goes down beneath a certain thing, then you have to like put money up as more- Yeah, that's collateral. a margin call, basically. Margin call, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's kind of yeah, interesting right. that the Absolutely. mechanisms haven't really changed between the South Seas bubble time all the way to today. And um, actually, it goes even further back than that, like the 14th century stuff I was talking about. Uh, you have exactly similar dynamics, like literal debasement of currency. But there's an interesting twist there because they were doing the literal, like bring in gold and uh, print out new coins. Um, the denomination mattered. We talked about Cantillon effects uh, before, right? So this is a very literal kind of Cantillon effect, like how you create new money. Uh, we talked about that in C, right? Do you remember? I don't think we went into it. We should definitely talk about it. What, uh, we did, we did. We talked about Cantillon effects in C, under C. But uh, the, uh, the way it works when you're debasing an actual currency is the denomination matters. So if you say bring in all the sort of $1 gold coins uh, to remint, chances are all the poor people and small scale traders are going to have, be holding much of it in circulation. Whereas if you say bring in like the an $100 gold coin, now you're talking about the gold that's locked up in chests and treasuries of like rich noblemen. Uh, so this happened in like there was a year when in the middle of the Hundred Years War when the French treasury was in like really bad shape. So another French example, but 500 years earlier. Uh, but they debased the currency something like 16 times within a single year. But they all always did it by at the lower denominations level. So all the rich people, they kept their high value, high percentage gold um, sort of specie. And all the poor people had their coins very steadily debased. So that, that was like a very clever way of issuing basically stock in um, uh, basically debasing a stock issue in poor people or something like that, where you keep lowering the basis of the value in, in an unbalanced way. So there's all sorts of like weird tricks you can do. And it's like, 
it's amazing that we've made no progress in about 700 years. It's like the same tricks run over and over again. The only difference is sometimes the basis of value is a little more believable than other times, right? Like, like Louisiana, I think that is reasonable speculation. You've discovered a new continent and you've managed to clear it of its existing inhabitants with smallpox or whatever. So you go, there's wealth to be made and you don't know that it's a swamp full of crocodiles, which is what Louisiana was, right? So, I mean, it's a reasonable speculation, uh, but then you can also print it out of thin air, which is, um, which is where I think they, like Enron, for example. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of that now. Like all the, the Federal Reserve is just buying up any kind of debt right now, right? Including high yield bonds and stuff from corporations. Yeah, actually, I wanted to make a, I thought your interesting point about which currency got debased is an interesting social thing, right? Like it kind of goes back to where are we going to put the highway? Are we going to yeah. put oh, it through yeah, the nice yeah. mansion space? Are we going to put it through these little guys? Well, the little guys, what are they going to do <laughs> if we cut their farms in half? Like, what are they going to do? Um, it's a good question. Maybe we'll get mad about it, but there's only one of them, you know, anyways. Um, I think like a while ago, I had an opportunity to talk to a guy about, basically it had to do, he was saying that, and I, I really wish I remember like the exact argument, so pardon, I might get this like slightly wrong, but he was basically saying, explaining how the United States, by keeping the Fed funds rate, um, so the federal government has like the, the lending rate or the rate at which you can borrow money from the Fed and how much you're expected to pay back is, so we're in monetary policy now. Um, I think this is monetary policy. I always get monetary and fiscal policy mixed up, but this is definitely monetary policy. Um, so the um, so basically, the Fed funds rate is the amount at which it costs uh, banks that are like so. Like if you think of like the banking system as a hierarchy, at the middle there's like the Fed, and then there's like the twenty or so banks yep. that can get money from the Fed, and then there's like all the like savings and loan banks that are kind of like arrayed underneath them. Um, and so when you go to the Fed to borrow money, um, there's like a certain rate of interest that you have to pay back. And that's like, I feel, I believe that's the fund yeah. rate. Like that's the, that's the amount of, yeah. okay. So that's like the fund, that's like the Fed, and it's been super low. We've kept it really low and it's been really low since like, I want to say since the Iraq war or like, yep. it's been like incredibly low. Um, like I want to say in the one percent. So like basically the um it was the I think it was at zero for a while and like nominal yeah, zero yeah. and uh, in in reality negative actually. Like if you adjust against inflation, there were like de facto negative interest rates for a while, especially in Europe. But yeah, so yeah. It's for a long time we've had zero to negative right. interest rates. But this means for you and me, like the little guys who have our money in savings accounts, that's where it matters is because the savings rate, so the Fed funds rate then becomes like a trickle down for your savings in your bank account, which are like have been, when I was in college, I think you could get like three to 5% and that was like, like a good CD. You could go get a certificate of deposit that would pay like three or 5%. This was like back in... To, oh, maybe it's like when I graduated from high school, so like 2005, 2006. You could still like go to the bank and expect to get like maybe three to five percent on your oh, yeah. money in a thing, but it hasn't. I've like, I have not seen those rates have not been back for 15 years. So like the in savings investment yep. rate of like just a deposit on your cash in a bank has been incredibly low. The guy I was talking to was basically saying that this was a. Um, this was basically the same as the government debasing like the small dollars of the people because the investment rate that we, you and me and anyone who has savings was so low that like our money basically, so inflation, as far as we know, it has basically stayed the same, but your investment, your savings rate isn't beating it, you're behind. Mm -hmm. So everyone who's able to like access better investments and better return on their money that isn't whatever the one percent is is huh. making more money is like the, the amount of money is flowing to them is greater than the amount of money so like they basically shut off the spigot to everyone savers of a certain low level and then anyone has enough money because the united states also has these rules about what you're allowed to invest in if you have yep. A small amount of money and if you have a lot of money the things that are available to you like big you can't invest you and i can't go and invest in just any hedge fund yeah you i think want. the accredited investor level is like 
at least a million dollars the last I checked. And if you wanted to like actually start a fund and invest for other people, I think it's like much higher. Like a buddy much of mine higher. in Texas yeah. um, is actually doing that. Uh, but yeah, so there's like, uh, th that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way where if you restrict who can invest in like the high written op opportunities and you keep interest rates really low, you're penalizing and debasing like um, the poorest people. So it's, it's like double jeopardy. It's not just that the distinction between public and private markets it's also like currency markets themselves um, yeah. there's there's another example i want to throw in there this happened in 2014 um, which was demonetization in india so uh, this was uh, marketed as a move to control the black market economy but it really was kind of like a handout to the rich people because they got kind of like word of it before other people did but basically all the currency notes uh, below 500 rupees were, um, or what, I forget what it was. Uh, but yeah, they be, they became illegal tender and you had to trade them in before a certain time. And since I was in the US at that time and I wasn't planning to visit anytime soon, I had like, uh, I think three or 4,000 rupees and 500 rupee bills that now are basically kindling. So I'm keeping them for like fun. But basically it was like a one-time freebie extraction of a lot of money from the poorest people who deal mainly in cash with some collateral damage of like the criminal classes who like uh, you know deal in cash for other reasons but mainly it was like all right um, if you sort of declare that this currency is illegal and you make it hard enough to like trade it in for the new money so create enough friction in the trade-in process that's another completely different way of debasing the currency and like making a one-time big pile of money. So the Indian government did that. So, and a lot of like poor people got hurt uh, because there was like huge queues in front of like um, ATMs and banks to change the money. It was a mess, but um, anyway, so lots of such examples. So lots of subtle ways you can debase currencies and use, I guess, monetary policy to like distort where you lay the roads between manors and small farms, basically. Like your metaphor is exactly right. So yeah, I think we we kind of made a discovery about how Cantillon effects work. <laughs> yeah, and so, I mean, to tie this back to Bitcoin, um, if we want to do that, or like we can talk about any cryptocurrency, I think I know how most of them work. Um, the like the mechanism how of how new money gets handed out so the thing that people like about bitcoin is that one it's very clear where the new money comes from so it's very clear how new money enters the system as like an asset class like where does new gold mm -hmm. come from new gold comes from the mines where does new stock certificates come from stock certificates come from the board of directors that run the company they can just you know when do you know so like new gold gets anytime new gold gets found then there's more gold um anytime the board of directors decides to issue new stock then there's more stock right um bitcoin has like a well-published well-known hard to change mechanism for where new bitcoin come from um and how many there's going to be of the bitcoin is well known and how they get handed out is done randomly um that's like the mining process the mining process is like in one way you can think of it as deciding who gets the next new amount of bitcoin that they hand out so if you think of bitcoin as a system that hands out new bitcoin every 10 minutes um how do you decide who to give the new bitcoin to um while the way that bitcoin has decided to do it is whoever wins the yeah we talked about lottery. this a few episodes it's, ago in edge right for happening we talked about the happening a few episodes ago uh, but, but that's like i think of it partly as a false sense of security because even though there's only 21 million um, bitcoins in the bitcoin theory forks are kind of like a cheat code right like you have what now there was bch uh, as the fork and oh sorry that's the uh, la county uh, if you can hear the beeping, that's the LA County text alert for uh, uh, curfew. So we have curfew at 6 p.m. today for- You guys curfew. have a curfew? Oh yeah, we've had curfew for like three days now. Uh, so we had wait, 8 p.m. curfew to- Are people not out protesting the curfew because they don't want to be stuck inside anymore? No, there's protests. There's protests breaking the curfew. There's lots of looting. So there's like all sorts of stuff going on here. So Texas is relatively peaceful, I'm guessing. <laughs> 
is chill. It's so chill. But it's like, there's some like irony here. Like just, it's kind of like, I guess, interrupt our thing. But I think there's some irony that like there were protests from maybe not in LA, in other parts of this country about not wanting to be stuck inside anymore and protesting the fact that all of the things were shut down. Uh, and now the governments are shutting things down even more harshly with like time to sit. What time is it there? It's like... It's 3.30 now. So this is just the alert that the curfew will start at 6 p.m. Oh, it starts at 6 p.m. But yeah. still, that's an early curfew. So forget yeah. going out to get dinner at your favorite place. That's Nobody's going to be doing that. I don't no, know. Well, they weren't going to be doing that anyway because um, of the pandemic restrictions, you can only get takeout. So. Oh, I see. Okay, so California yeah. is like... But, and also, I think at this point, uh, they were trying to open up like um, a week or two ago and they were starting to like ease restrictions. But so mm -hmm. many restaurants and other things, not restaurants so much, but... Uh, the Starbucks got looted, a couple of Starbucks on my block, a um, few blocks away did. So they, business owners now have no incentive to open back up because this, you know, businesses that opened up uh, like hoping for great things and they did a couple of days of good business and then they got looted because of this. So, uh, so we should talk about, we should see if we can figure out a way in which looting is another way of debasing the currency or something. Uh, but just to complete that thought I was um, having, even though nominally Bitcoin, you can't debase it because it's a fixed supply that's algorithmically determined. Anytime you create a fork, you kind of like create sort of a soft debasement because I remember when BTC forked into BTC plus BCH, the combined value was higher than BTC just before, right? So in some sense, um, and since then there have been at least four or five, uh, keeps coming. Uh, so there have been at least four or five forks of uh, Bitcoin. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what the total market value of all of them is. And um, uh, so in that sense, I think even Bitcoin can be debased. It's not debasement immune. Uh, but it's interesting because it's not, it's not like they're handing you silver back and saying this is still Lira. They're saying, oh, now here's this new fancy coin called the Lina that is made out of paper mache uh that you can also trade with isn't that cool um so i think it's still easy and possible maybe not for everyone maybe this is like more of it maybe this is actually a problem more in like the market of ideas than the people who actually understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes like if you didn't exactly know exactly what the relationship is between bitcoin and like bitcoin cash and bitcoin satoshi's vision um i'm embarrassed that i know what all those things are it's fine um but uh, like, to me, I'm like, well, no, I, I know what Bitcoin is. And I know that that is not at all the same thing as these other things. And that's easy to see because the software doesn't even run. Like you need different software for each of them. Like, okay, let me push back a little bit here though. Because when you have forks in a cryptocurrency, unlike you can't fork gold, right? Like you can't say, hey, I don't like gold the way it is. And I'm going to declare like soil or granite uh, gold two or something, right? So you can't do it that way. Whereas when you say, I'm going to fork something like Bitcoin, you're really betting on the teams behind each of the forks, right? Who stays, who leaves, who are the core developers who are betting on which fork. So in that sense, you're betting partly on the algorithm at the fork point, and then you're betting on which team seems to have more credibility, right? So in that sense, uh, cryptocurrencies can be forked in a way commodity monies cannot be forked because commodity monies, there's no meaning to the idea of forking. You seem like you're reluctant to buy that conclusion. I'm like, I think, I don't disagree with what you said about like the teams behind the currencies. I think that is like a really good thing to look at. I mean, the number of coins that not even these forks supposed forks of Bitcoin, like so many other things are actually also just forks of the Bitcoin cord base, like Dogecoin is a Bitcoin fork, Zcash is a Bitcoin fork. Um, and by fork, I mean, they like took the source code and made a bunch oh, yeah, of changes okay. and did their own thing. Litecoin is a Bitcoin fork. Like the actual, this is actually an interesting point. The actual number of code bases that have been written from scratch, like of coins that are running on written from scratch, independent implementations of software that aren't based on the Bitcoin code base is uh, probably less than you would think. 
Yeah, so Ethereum is one and a couple of others, I guess, are like, like um, Zcash is uh, like significantly different. But uh, the point- No, but it started on the Bitcoin code base. Yeah, but, but there's an important distinction here, right? Like uh, if you look at the first kind of fork, which is you just take the code and start another blockchain, you're not yeah. actually mirroring the distribution of um, coins in the original. Like you're not doing the one for mm -hmm. one uh, grant of like, if you have one Bitcoin, you also get one Bitcoin cash, right? So you don't fork the ledger itself. You just um, yes, code. It's not That's one it's kind of, uh, the second is you actually fork the ledger too. And therefore, if you had the old money, you get some of the new money as well. And the mm -hmm. third oh, kind yeah. is, we just have this loose relationship. Like when Ethereum uh, did its Genesis block, it um, sold its uh, uh, Genesis tokens in Bitcoin. So you had to have Bitcoin to buy into the Genesis grant of Ethereum. Uh, you're aware of this? Uh, that's how I got in on the Genesis sale of um, Ethereum. So the first time Ethereum did its Genesis sale, you could only buy it through Bitcoin. You couldn't buy it through like dollars or anything. So I happened to have some Bitcoin and I bought some Ethereum and that turned out to be the best investment I ever made. But that's, in a sense, you could say that's another kind of fork where you're uh, leveraging the trust that's already latent in the Bitcoin investment ecosystem and using it to seed the trust in a new thing. Where you're saying, all right, this is kind of like a give back to um, the value Bitcoin has created. But that's only if, but that's only if people understand, that's only if there is confusion about the substitution is my point. Like if you yeah. actually understand that like Bitcoin is not any of those other things and that there is a real difference and that that difference really matters, then I think that there isn't any confusion. Um, but I think you're right. But it's, uh, that, I like, mean, there, there's still, the, I, I think my point is there is room for genuine confusion. Like when a true fork happens, the kind of fork where you actually um, fork the ledger too, not just the code, uh, sometimes it's like just some jerk trying to like create a power trip for themselves. Uh, but sometimes there's like a genuine uh, sort of argument, right? Like uh, yeah. there's a block size argument, I believe at one point in, uh, was that Ethereum? Yeah. Mm, it's also uh, Bitcoin. That was a big Bitcoin, Bitcoin too, yeah. So that, that, that was a genuine technical argument where some size. people said that, all right, keeping to the original block size is the correct technical answer. Other people disagreed. So there was... Uh, there's legitimacy to the fork in a, in a sense. So, but partly it was a matter of technical taste, which one you bet on. It so happened that there was a fairly strong consensus in favor of one and they got to own the brand. So it ends up being who gets to own the brand, I think. I think this has been a bigger problem for some of the other post split Bitcoin probably forks. So it's actually kind of funny. Like, so I think there's like an interesting sort of dynamic that's happened in the Bitcoin fork ecosystem. I don't know the exact details, but my understanding is that like, so you had the, you originally had one big Bitcoin happy family ecosystem and everyone had Bitcoin and then some faction decided they didn't like what was going on and wanted more control or like didn't have disagreed with the things so they split and they became, let's say Bitcoin cash. When that happened, it seems like most of the people who are in favor of the fork method of splitting up a community went along and left the original Bitcoin community and developed this new Bitcoin cash community, which since then has fractured into even more things like that. <laughs> so it was like, it was like a splitting of like into two, like we believe in forks and then how do they solve problems? Well, they just oh. make more forks. Whereas like the people who did not buy into the fork mentality have not created more forks. I think is interesting. Oh, I was not aware of that. So are you saying most of the newer Bitcoin forks actually are from BCH rather than BDC or something like that? I, that's my understanding, yeah. Oh, that's, that's kind of fascinating because it's like almost, it sounds like you're suggesting that there's an addiction to forking as a way of solving uh, conflict. And if you sort of get into the habit, you'll constantly be forking way too much. And then you'll basically never solve real problems. You'll never like debate and solve problems. You'll just fork. Right? Yeah, but everyone think, has their own feudal mansion then, Venkat. It'll continue to fork until each man has his own chain and ledger that he owns and controls. But it's a kind of debasement, right? Like if I remember the first Bitcoin fork, the ratio ended up, uh, by the time I sold out, the ratio was like something like uh, one Bitcoin was about five or six times one Bitcoin cash or something. Yeah. But then forks from that, it keeps going lower and lower. So it's like, yeah. You're kind of like debasing it with uh, 
more base metals, basically. So if Bitcoin is yeah. gold, the fourth fork away from it is like lead. But I think you can say interesting things about the mansionism that you were talking that you wanted to see or think you would see more of is that each of these little things, as you branch them off and fracture them more and more, the total value of each one goes down because the system as a whole is worth more than each of the parts totally. yeah. individually yeah. to an extent because of reasons. Yeah, I mean, uh, simple reasons of economies of scale of agriculture, right? I mean, this is why... Um, so this is an interesting one. This is the reason uh, primogenitor emerged where the eldest son inherits everything. Because if you keep the land holdings unified, you can like do farming at like a economic scale. Whereas um, legal systems where it gets equally split amongst all the children, including men and women, you have like this constant fragmentation. And by the third or fourth generation, reasonably good economically viable land holdings become these tiny little garden plots that nobody can farm economically. And it's in a way an emergent way of doing what you were talking about earlier, the uh, Robert Moses thing. It's like you can have an autocratic designer desi deciding that he's going to cut through like a bunch of little farms, splitting them in two and making them less viable. Or they can actually do it to themselves. If they're forking enough, they don't need a Robert Moses. They can like fragment themselves into uselessness pretty frequent, pretty, pretty easily. So yeah, that's, that's a failure mode, whether you're Bitcoin or you're talking land fragmentation makes it less economically viable. So anybody who resists the temptation and sort of keeps things in larger lumps, it sort of um, is valuable. So yeah, I guess I'm arguing against myself that uh, maybe we shouldn't break up these big nation states and create little city states and feudal territories. I had, what was the, I had like a really funny extension. Oh my God, what was it? Um, oh. I'm not gonna remember what thing I wanted to say was. Um, oh man, there was something really funny that I wanted to bring back there, and yeah, I can't remember what it was. Next time um, you think of a good joke, just yell at me to shut up so you can tell the joke. I'm not good with I that. Well, too much. I get too curious about what, where you're gonna go with it. Is the problem? <laughs> so like, I want to hear what you have to say because it may end up somewhere that I don't know. Um, I already know what my joke is. I don't know what you're gonna say is so. It's Oh, I know what it is. I had to do with, so I've been watching a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff lately, not as much recently, I need to finish his biblical series, but he has this comment, and I think I was tweeting about it a few days ago, where he, um, it's kind of, it's like at the very end, someone asks him a question, and he kind of goes off and like extemporizes on whatever it was, and it had to do with um, something about like men and the way that men and women deal with different things, um, and he has this great quote where he's like, women have never been in charge of anything. So we don't know what a women run government would look like, but <laughs> women aren't as into like hierarchy as men is like, they like to make sure that everyone has enough. Like they're very into like giving out things to everyone such that everyone is well taken care of and provided for. And he was like, and that's a horrible idea. It definitely wouldn't work. Um, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Just like, I don't know, it just tickles me. But I think that's like, it kind of, you can tie it back into this like whole, well, if you just give it out and keep dividing the things up to everyone, then everyone has something. It's true, but none of it is worth anything. Um, which I think well, is that's, interesting. Like, I, I think that's, that's interesting. interesting. I hadn't thought of the gender angle on that. Uh, but it, it, did you ever read um, Sarah Constantin's uh, article on Ho cultures? I think I might have mentioned that under H, H O E not HO. So uh, that's like, uh, she, um, said, uh, we should link to that essay, but um, it's basically her example of an actual viable um, woman managed society. So it's actually um, a counter example to Jordan Peterson's point that women have never managed everything. Uh, so she, he's wrong there. It's like historically there have been cultures managed by women. So uh, whole cultures as in like uh, farming yams and other low mechanical effort um, kind of crops, things that women can farm with just like little implements like hoes. So those are called hoe cultures, whereas plow cultures are the opposite. So plows are these bigger tools that require either uh, male muscle power or oxen to like till the land. So they tend to have very different structures. And um, Sarah's mm -hmm. point in her essay was when land is uh, sort of um, farmed according to hoe cultures and you grow yams and stuff, men behave very differently and you have like basically uh, 
uh, an existence proof that you can actually have a stable society run by women in a particular different way. Uh, but uh, I would say that's actually, uh, so I think Jordan Peterson's analysis of that would be wrong. Um, if um, that whole idea of like dividing and taking care of everybody, I don't think it would lead to like the ma maximum fragmentation because women might want to take care of everybody if he's right about that, but they also tend to pool resources back together. So it's, if, if men have like a forking <laughs> this predisposition, women might have like a merge conflict resolution tendency. I don't know if that's true, but it sounds like, yeah. I think it's like, so I think this is one of the things that makes Jordan Peterson so controversial is that I think <laughs> to a certain extent his like experience or like willingness to go out and look for counterexamples that make him wrong is very low to like non-existent. So his like, his theories on the things that he knows well are very good, but he definitely runs into edge cases where like, I think he says things that are easy to falsify because like clearly there are examples of women running cultures just like he and he's so adamant that like that has never happened before and you're like dude like uh, yeah. uh, i don't think that's true and you could probably also like if you really cared about fixing that you could find counter examples but you don't so i think partly because he navigates so much by mythic archetypes so he's got the whole men are order women are chaos order chaos so theology coming from, I guess, Jungian archetypes or something. And that's fun. Mm -hmm. You and I chat about that too with, uh, you know, Myers-Briggs and other superstitions. It's fun, but if you make that your only analytical lens, then you run into situations where men are the chaos factor and women are the order factor and the example doesn't fit your political theory and it becomes nonsense, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was actually surprised when you mentioned last episode that you're watching him. So now it sounds like uh, your hate watching him or something. <laughs> okay. I, well, I think like, so I, I really, I think he makes really good and interesting points and I find it very generative to hear what he has to say because it gives me new and interesting ideas about other things, but it, there's definitely a huge undercurrent of things that he says that I'm just like, eh, I don't think that's right. Like, uh, he's, he's definitely provocative and I, I think I mentioned before I have met him once and had an interesting yeah. conversation with him. So he's definitely provocative and makes you think and it's great to have a good conversation with him. But I think he has had this effect, especially on like pretty, so, I, so there's a type of really young guy, like typically 18 to 20, like either college age or going to college or not, uh, who kind of fall in love with him and fall into the Jordan Peterson bunny trail and kind of like don't get exposed to any other divergent sources of information at all. And it's kind of hard to talk to them. It's like, it's good that you're getting some ideas of mythic archetypes and, you know, you know, Jungian analysis from Jordan Peterson, but try these three other things for size. And it's like hard to talk to them until they do that. But um, yeah, th th I think that's why he's had such a huge popular impact on culture right now, because he's saying things that are very appealing to particular people who kind of want to hear those messages. But, and he's uh, right he about <laughs> the things he's right about. It's like the hardest idea, like the hardest wrong ideologies to root out are the ones that have have core truths to them. Because, and I think that Thielism, like Peter Thiel, we didn't talk about him at all, but I think Thielism runs into this problem also with like, yep. he's got some very core tenets that are like incredibly true and he has done a really good job. Uh, we, talk, uh, we, we can talk about him under T, but yeah. um, he does a really good job of having really core truths that are true and they're very true. And he makes a good point of how he shows people the truth of these things in their lives um, but it's also attached to this truth is like a certain ideology, like a worldview, um, that leaves a lot of strange things, like that definitely leads to like weird places, I think. Or, like, so this is a common theme I see in the end, that entire side of the spectrum, whether you call it, you know, the alt-right or, um, neo-reactionaries or intellectual dark web. So there's a whole constellation of these little ideological valleys, I almost think of them as, mm. but you've got these people. So if you think of it in sort of in terms of an optimization metaphor, these people yeah. have strong empirical grounding in a little valley. And so they overfit sort of part of the valley they know well through empirical grounding. So you yeah. get, so if you kind of imagine visually, you've got this landscape with hills and valleys, these people have 
really strong understanding of the one value they're in <clears throat> and they fit the universe to that. So you get this sort of paraboloid shape um, thing they live in and that's their universe. And anytime it extends into domains where there are other valleys, they kind of like just do uh, what I think of as mythological extrapolations. So yeah. like that's basically it. You're in a valley, you know your valley well, and when you want to extend past it, you take something like Jungian order chaos archetypes and extend it way beyond. And really your theory is like hovering miles above the reality of historical examples of women run societies. So it's very anti-scientific. It's, it's very religious. Yeah. It's a very it's religiously totally. approaching it, which is fascinating. So it's like, yeah. and I think it's fascinating because a lot of the intellectual dark web, uh, local maxima, like society, ideology is whatever, operate in the arena of scientific scientificism scientific yep, scientism yep. like the the like the number of times that jordan peterson in his lecture says i really want this to be like rational and the strong grounding and like scientific truth as well as whatever and then he gives sermons his his lectures are sermons about oh, totally. his ideologies um and like it's, it's it's so it's just interesting to me that it's like happening in the theater where they claim that scientific thought and processes or they're driving raison de s so like this is like their reason yep. for being and for doing the work that they're doing is bringing this like scientific truth and about reality yeah. and yet at the same time the method of like dealing with the world is very religious it's not a scientific mindset yeah it's 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 not just reluctance to do this confirmation so disconfirmation, if you sort of treat it as part of a religion, like you're describing, it, it can become its own ritual. Like, you know, like a lot of people in the rationalist world, they understand this stuff. They understand that the way you test an argument is by trying to disconfirm it rather than just looking for confirmatory evidence. But they approach it in a ritual sense. Whereas uh, in my experience, people with a true scientific sensibility, they don't seek disconfirmation because it's like part of the ritual epistemology. They do it simply because they're curious. They want to explore beyond the boundaries of what they know. They are just curious about, hey, what's in the valley next door? Maybe I go there and see something. And I think this is fundamentally why, even though I have lots of friends and a lot of things I think are neighboring these little subcultures, fundamentally I fall on sort of the left liberal side of the divide because I think they're fundamentally more curious. Like they get over disgust, aversion, responses to things they're not familiar with. They wander into new valleys, explore like new things that make them uncomfortable. And they do I that because like they like me, it. Like me hanging out in the JVP like valley. Yeah, like, yeah. hey, what's going on here? This is kind of cool. Like, yeah. And when they do go yeah. over to sort of what they think of as enemy territory, they go there with like this almost like nightly, I'm here to conduct war and prove the liberals wrong kind of thing. Like mm. they walk in with the assumption that there's nothing to be learned on the uh, in the enemy valley or something like that i, I, I just thought uh, i think we're running over late but uh, there's one example i wanted to share so there's this um, guy what's his name rick perlman or something he wrote this book called nixon land so it's probably the best history book on the nixon years and it's like a really solid sort of uh, expensive expansive history of how the nixon era created the current cultural war and political environment and <clears throat> Uh, yesterday, I saw an article by him in Mother Jones, which is this extreme far left magazine, as you probably know. And I was like, huh, I didn't get the impression reading Nixon Land that this guy is far left. So why is this article appearing here? So this one is, by the way, about uh, will um, these riots help or hurt Trump or something? So it's a historian approach to what's the history of riots and do they tend to help presidents or not? And the article, again, didn't give me a clear sense of his politics. Is he left or right? Uh, but the magazine sort of made me suspicious. Like, why is he in this far left magazine? And I was chatting with a friend of mine on who knows him personally. And he was like, yeah, this guy's like extreme far left and he manages to hide it very well in his books. And I think this is a sort of dead giveaway of um, sort of uh, left liberal sympathies where your curiosity is strong enough and uh, overriding enough that if you're genuinely curious about stuff, you go exploring it, you write books about it or make documentaries about it. Your curiosity can actually overwhelm your politics. Whereas I don't see that when the right side of the spectrum goes exploring on the left side, where it's clear they're out for war. 
they're out to like debate and win, right? Uh, and you get the Which sense. Which we all of, know what happens when you spend a lot of money on wars. <laughs> Okay, so we should save this. We've got a lot of, uh, did we do P yet? So we can do progressivism for P and we can do Thielism for T. So the, we'll have plenty of opportunities to talk about this stuff. Yeah, looking forward to it. Oh, Venkat, it's always a pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on our show. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show, Lisa. We'll see you tomorrow next week for O. Oh. Okay, great. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.